U.S. Senate Career of Joe Biden Joe Biden, the President of the United States, served in the United States Senate for 36 years, from 1973 to 2009. A member of the Democratic Party from his home state of Delaware, Biden was first elected to the Senate in 1972 and was sworn into office at the age of 30. He was later re-elected six times. He is Delaware's longest-serving senator. In 2009, Biden retired from the Senate to become vice president. After serving two terms as vice president, Biden became president in 2021. 1972 U.S. Senate campaign in Delaware, 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 Joe Biden, a member of the Newcastle County Council, ran in the 1972 U.S. Senate election in Delaware against Republican incumbent Senator J. Caleb Boggs. Boggs was considering retirement, which would likely have left U.S. Representative Pete DuPont and Wilmington Mayor Harry G. Haskell Jr. in a divisive primary fight. To avoid that, President Nixon helped convince Boggs to run again with full party support. No other Democrat wanted to run against Boggs. Biden's campaign had little and was given no chance of winning. His sister, Valerie Biden Owen, managed his campaign, as she would his future campaigns and other family members staffed it. The campaign relied upon handed out newsprint position papers and meeting voters face to face. The state's smallness and lack of a major media market made that approach feasible. He did receive some help from the AFL CIO and Democratic pollster Patrick Cadell. His campaign focused on withdrawal from Vietnam, the environment, civil rights, mass transit, more equitable taxation, health care, the public's dissatisfaction with politics as usual, and change. During the summer, he trailed by almost 30 percentage points, but his energy level, his attractive young family, and his ability to connect with voters' emotions gave him an advantage over the ready-to-retire Boggs. Biden won the November 7 election by 3,162 votes. Family Deaths On December 18, 1972, Biden's wife Nelia and their one-year-old daughter Amy were killed in an automobile accident in Hawkinson, Delaware, causing each of his children bone fractures. 93-98 Biden considered resigning to care for them, but Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield persuaded him not to. United States Senate 1973-2009 Recovery and Remarriage Biden was sworn into office on January 5, 1973, by Secretary of the Senate Francis R. Baleo in a small chapel at the Delaware Division of the Wilmington Medical Center. 93-98, Bo was wheeled in with his leg still in traction. Hunter, who had already been released, was also there, as were other members of the extended family. 93-98, witnesses and television cameras were also present, and the event received national attention. 93-98, at age 30, Biden became the sixth youngest senator in U.S. history, and one of only 18 who took office before turning 31. However, the accident that killed his wife and daughter left him filled with both anger and religious doubt. I liked to walk around seedy neighborhoods at night when I thought there was a better chance of finding a fight. I had not known I was capable of such rage. I felt God had played a horrible trick on me. To be at home every day for his two young sons, Biden began commuting every day by an Amtrak train 90 minutes, each way from his Delaware home to Washington, D.C., which he continued to do throughout his Senate career. In the accident's aftermath, Biden had trouble focusing on work and appeared to just go through the motions of being a senator. In his memoirs, Biden notes that his staffers were taking bets on how long he would last. A single father for five years, he left standing orders that he be interrupted in the Senate at any time if his sons called. In remembrance of his wife and daughter, 
Biden does not work on December 18, the anniversary of the accident. In 1975, Biden met teacher Jill Tracy Jacobs, which he credits her with renewing his interest in both politics and life. They married in 1977 at the chapel at the United Nations in New York. Early Senate Activities During his first years in the Senate, Biden focused on consumer protection and environmental issues and called for greater government accountability. In 1974, Biden was named by Time magazine as one of the 200 faces for the future in a profile that mentioned what had happened to his family, calling him self-confident and compulsively ambitious. In a June 1, 1974, interview with the Washingtonian, Biden described himself as liberal on civil rights and liberties, senior citizens' concerns and health care, but conservative on other issues, including abortion and the draft. Biden became ranking minority member of the U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary in 1981. In 1984, he was a Democratic floor manager for the successful passage of the Comprehensive Crime Control Act. Over time, the law's tough on crime provisions became controversial on the left and among criminal justice reform proponents, and in 2019 Biden called his role in passing the legislation a big mistake. His supporters praised him for modifying some of the law's worst provisions, and it was his most important legislative accomplishment at that time. He first considered running for president that year, after gaining notice for speeches he gave to party audiences that simultaneously scolded and encouraged Democrats. At 216 in 1993, Biden voted in favor of 10 U.S.C. at 654, a section of a broader federally mandated policy that deemed homosexuality incompatible with military life thereby banning gay Americans from serving in the United States armed forces in any capacity without exception. The law was subsequently modified by President Clinton through the issuance of DOD Directive 1304.26, subsequently nicknamed Don't Ask, Don't Tell or Debt, which accommodated closeted service to the extent that a service member's homosexual sexual orientation was neither discovered nor disclosed. The ban was held unconstitutional in log cabin Republicans v. United States for violation of First and Fifth Amendment rights. In 1996, Biden voted in favor of the Defense of Marriage Act 1 U.S.C. S. 7, which prohibited the federal government from recognizing any same-sex marriage, barring individuals in such marriages from equal protection under federal law and allowing states to do the same. In 2013, Section 3 of DeMau was ruled unconstitutional and partially struck down in United States v. Windsor. The Obama administration did not defend the law and congratulated Windsor. In 2015, DeMau was ruled unconstitutional in totality in Obergefell v. Hodges. Regarding foreign policy, during his first decade in the Senate, Biden focused on arms control issues. In response to Congress's refusal to ratify the Salt Roman II Treaty signed in 1979, when the Reagan administration wanted to interpret the 1972 Salt I Treaty loosely to allow the Strategic Defense Initiative to proceed, Biden argued for strict adherence to the treaty's terms. He clashed again with the Reagan administration in 1986 over economic sanctions against South Africa, receiving considerable attention when he excoriated Secretary of State George P. Schultz at a Senate hearing because of the administration's support of that country, which continued to practice apartheid. Opposition to Mandatory Desegregation Busing In the mid minus 1970s Biden was one of the Senate's leading opponents of mandatory desegregation busing. His white Delaware constituents strongly opposed it, and such opposition nationwide later led his party to mostly abandon school desegregation policies. In his first Senate campaign, Biden expressed support for the Supreme Court's 1971 Swan decision, which supported busing programs to integrate school districts to remedy de jure segregation, but opposed it to remedy de facto segregation, as in Delaware. 
He said Republicans were using busing as a scare tactic to court Southern white votes and along with Boggs voiced opposition to a House of Representatives constitutional amendment banning busing. In 1974, Biden voted to table an amendment to an omnibus education bill promoted by Edward Gurney, RFL, that contained anti-busing measures and anti-school desegregation clauses. In May, Senator Robert Griffin RMI attempted to revive an amended version of the amendment. Minority Leader Hugh Scott RPA and Majority Leader Mike Mansfield DMT offered to leave the text of Griffin's amendment intact but at the qualifier that such legislation was not intended to weaken the judiciary. Biden voted for this compromise, angering his local voters. Following this, some Delaware residents met at the Krebs School in Newport to protest integration. Biden spoke to the auditorium and said his position on school busing was evolving, emphasizing that busing in Delaware was in his opinion beyond court restrictions. The crowd was unconvinced and heckled him until he yielded the microphone. This, along with the prospect of a busing plan in Wilmington, Biden and anti-busing senators wanted to limit the scope of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 with respect to the federal government's power to enforce school integration policies. After 1975, Biden took a harsher line on further legislative action to limit busing. That year, Helms proposed an anti-integration amendment to an education bill that would stop the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, HEW, from collecting data about students' or teachers' races and thereby prevent it from defunding districts that refused to integrate. Biden supported this amendment, saying, I am sure it comes as a surprise to some of my colleagues that a senator with a voting record such as mine stands up and supports it. He said busing was a bankrupt idea that violated the cardinal rule of common sense and that his opposition would make it easier for other liberals to follow suit. But he had also supported integrationist Senator Edward Brooks' RMA initiatives on housing, job opportunities, and voting rights. Civil rights lawyer and NOP Legal Defense Fund Director Jack Greenberg criticized Biden's support for the bill, saying it heaved a brick through the window of school integration with Biden's hand on the brick. Biden supported a measure Senator Robert Biden DWV sponsored that forbade the use of federal funds to transport students beyond their closest school. This was adopted as part of the Labor HEW Appropriations Act of 1976. In 1977, Biden co-sponsored an amendment with Thomas Eagleton DMO to close loopholes in Biden's amendment. A 1977 status report on school desegregation by the Federal Civil Rights Commission in Washington, D.C., said the enactment of Eagleton Biden would be an actual violation on the part of the federal government of the Fifth Amendment and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. President Carter signed the amendment into law in 1978. Biden repeatedly asked for, and received, the support of Senator James Eastland DMS on anti-busing measures. 1988 Presidential Campaign Biden ran for the 1988 Democratic presidential nomination, formally declaring his candidacy at the Wilmington train station on June 9, 1987. He was attempting to become the youngest president since John F. Kennedy. When the campaign began, he was considered a potentially strong candidate because of his moderate image, his speaking ability on the stump, his appeal to baby boomers, his high-profile position as chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee at the upcoming Robert Bork Supreme Court nomination hearings, and his fundraising appeal. At 83, he raised $1.07 million in the first quarter of 1987, more than any other candidate. At 83, by August 1987, Biden's campaign, whose messaging was confused due to staff rivalries, 108-109 had begun to lag behind those of Michael Dukakis and Dick Jeffart, though he had still raised more funds than any candidate but Dukakis, and was seeing an upturn in Iowa polls. 83 in September 1987, the campaign ran into trouble when he was accused of plagiarizing a speech that had been made earlier that year by British Labour Party leader Neil Kinnock. 
Kinnick's speech included the lines, Why am I the first Kinnick in a thousand generations to be able to get to university? Then pointing to his wife in the audience, Why is Glennie's the first woman in her family in a thousand generations to be able to get to university? Was it because all our predecessors were thick? While Biden's speech included the lines, I started thinking as I was coming over here, why is it that Joe Biden is the first in his family ever to go to a university? Then pointing to his wife in the audience, why is it that my wife who is sitting out there in the audience is the first in her family to ever go to college? Is it because our fathers and mothers were not bright? Is it because I'm the first Biden in a thousand generations to get a college and a graduate degree that I was smarter than the rest? Biden had in fact cited Kinnock as the source for the formulation on previous occasions. But he made no reference to the original source at the August 23 Democratic debate at the Iowa State Fair being reported on 230-232 or in an August 26 interview with the National Education Association. Moreover, while political speeches often appropriate ideas and language from each other, Biden's use came under more scrutiny because he changed aspects of his own family's background to match Kinnick's. Biden was soon found to have lifted passages from a 1967 speech by Robert F. Kennedy earlier that year, for which his aides took the blame, and a short phrase from the 1961 inaugural address of John F. Kennedy, and to have done the same with a 1976 passage from Hubert H. Humphrey two years earlier. A few days later, Biden's plagiarism incident in law school came to public light. Video was also released showing that when earlier questioned by a New Hampshire resident about his grades in law school, he had said he graduated in the top half of his class, that he had attended law school on a full scholarship, and that he had received three degrees in college, each of which was untrue or an exaggeration. Advisors and reporters pointed out that he falsely claimed to have marched in the civil rights movement. The limited amount of other news about the race amplified these revelations, when most of the public was not yet paying attention to the campaigns. Biden thus fell into what the Washington Post writer Paul Taylor called that year's trend, a trial by media ordeal. 86, 88, lacking a strong group of supporters to help him survive the crisis. 88, 89, he withdrew from the race on September 23, 1987, saying his candidacy had been overrun by the exaggerated shadow of his past mistakes. After Biden withdrew, it was revealed that the Dukakis campaign had secretly made a video highlighting the Biden-Kinnick comparison and distributed it to news outlets. Later in 1987, the Delaware Supreme Court's Board of Professional Responsibility cleared Biden of the law school plagiarism charges regarding his standing as a lawyer. Brain surgeries In 1988, Biden suffered two brain aneurysms, one on the right side and one on the left. Each required surgery, with high risk of long-term impact on brain functionality. In February 1988, after suffering from several episodes of increasingly severe neck pain, Biden was taken by long-distance ambulance to Walter Reed Army Medical Center and given life-saving surgery to correct an intracranial berry aneurysm that had begun leaking. While recuperating, he suffered a pulmonary embolism, a major complication. Another operation to repair a second aneurysm, which had caused no symptoms but was at risk of bursting, was performed in May 1988. The hospitalization and recovery kept Biden from his duties in the Senate for seven months. Biden has had no recurrences or effects from the aneurysms since then. In retrospect, Biden's family came to believe the early end to his presidential campaign had been a blessing in disguise, for had he still been campaigning in 1988, he might well not have stopped to seek medical attention and the condition might have become unsurvivable. In 2013, Biden said, they take a saw and they cut your head off, and they literally had to take the top of my head off. He also said he was told he would have less than a 50% chance of full recovery. In 2019, 
the neurosurgeon who operated on Biden in 1988 said he felt Biden was fit to run for president and joked. Senate Judiciary Committee Biden was a longtime member of the U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary. He chaired it from 1987 to 1995 and served as ranking minority member from 1981 to 1987 and from 1995 to 1997. While chairman, Biden presided over two of the most contentious U.S. Supreme Court confirmation hearings in history, Robert Bork's in 1987 and Clarence Thomas's in 1991. In the Bork hearings, he stated his opposition to Bork soon after the nomination, reversing his approval in an interview of a hypothetical Bork nomination he had made the previous year and angering conservatives, who thought he could not conduct the hearings fairly. At the close, he won praise for conducting the proceedings fairly and with good humor and courage, despite his presidential campaign's collapse in the middle of them. Rejecting some of the less intellectually honest arguments that other Bork opponents were making, Biden framed his discussion around the belief that the U.S. Constitution provides rights to liberty and privacy that extend beyond those explicitly enumerated in the text, and that Bork's strong originalism was ideologically incompatible with that view. Bork's nomination was rejected in the committee by a 9-5 vote, and then rejected in the full Senate, 58-42. In the Thomas hearings, Biden's questions on constitutional issues were often long and convoluted, to the point that Thomas sometimes forgot the question being asked. Biden's style annoyed many viewers. Thomas later wrote that despite Biden's earlier private assurances, his questions had been akin to being balls. The nomination came out of the committee without a recommendation, with Biden opposed. In part due to his own bad experiences with his presidential campaign, Biden was reluctant to let personal matters into the hearings. He initially shared with the committee, but not the public, Anita Hill's sexual harassment charges, on the grounds she was not yet willing to testify. After she did, Biden did not permit other witnesses to testify further on her behalf, such as Angela Wright, who was present, waiting to testify, and who had made a similar charge and experts on harassment. Biden said he was striving to preserve Thomas's right to privacy and the hearing's decency. The full Senate confirmed Thomas by a 52-48 vote, with Biden again opposed. During and afterward, liberal legal groups and women's groups strongly criticized Biden for mishandling the hearings and not doing enough to support Hill. Biden later sought out women to serve on the Judiciary Committee and emphasized women's issues in the committee's legislative agenda. In April 2019, he called Hill to express regret over how he treated her. After the conversation, Hill said she remained deeply unsatisfied. Biden was involved in crafting many federal crime laws. He spearheaded the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994, also known as the Biden Crime Law, which included the Federal Assault Weapons Ban, which expired in 2004 after its 10-year sunset period, and was not renewed. It also included the Violence Against Women Act VAWA, which contains a broad array of measures to combat domestic violence. In 2000, the Supreme Court ruled in United States v. Morrison that the VAWA section, allowing a federal civil remedy for victims of gender-motivated violence, exceeded Congress's authority and was therefore unconstitutional. Congress reauthorized VAWA in 2000 and 2005. Biden has said, I consider the Violence Against Women Act the single most significant legislation that I've crafted during my 35-year tenure in the Senate. In 2004 and 2005, he enlisted major American technology companies in diagnosing the problems of the Austin. Biden was critical of the actions of independent counsel Kenneth Starr during the 1990s Whitewater controversy and Lewinsky scandal investigations, and said, it's going to be a cold day in hell before another independent counsel would be granted the same powers. He voted to acquit on both charges during the impeachment of President Clinton. As chairman of the International Narcotics Control Caucus, 
Biden wrote the laws that created the U.S. drug Tsar, who oversees and coordinates national drug control policy. In April 2003, he introduced the Reducing Americans' Vulnerability to Ecstasy Rave Act. He continued to work to stop the spread of date rape drugs such as flunitrase spam and party drugs such as ecstasy and ketamine. In 2004, he worked to pass a bill outlawing steroids like androstenedione, the drug many baseball players used. Biden's Kids 2000 legislation established a public-private partnership to provide computer centers, teachers, internet access, and technical training to young people, particularly low-income and at-risk youth. Senate Foreign Relations Committee Delaware Matters Biden was a familiar figure to his Delaware constituency by virtue of his daily train commute from there and generally sought to attend to state needs. He strongly supported increased Amtrak funding and rail security. He hosted barbecues and an annual Christmas dinner for the Amtrak crews, who sometimes held the last train of the night a few minutes so he could catch it. He earned the nickname Amtrak Joe as a result, and in 2011, Amtrak's Wilmington Station was named the Joseph R. Biden Jr. Railroad Station in honor of the 7,000-plus trips he made from there. He was an advocate for Delaware military installations, including Dover Air Force Base and Newcastle Air National Guard Base. In 1978, when Biden was seeking re-election to the Senate, Wilmington's federally mandated cross-district busing plan generated much turmoil. Biden's compromise solution between his white constituents and African-American leaders was to introduce legislation to outlaw the court's power to enforce certain types of busing. White anti-integrationists seized on a comment Biden made that he would support the use of federal helicopters if Wilmington's schools could not be voluntarily integrated, and Delaware Knopf head Littleton P. Mitchell later said Biden adequately represented our community for many years but he quivered at one time on busing. The compromise nearly alienated him from both working-class whites and African Americans, but tensions ended after the end of a teacher's strike that began overpay issues raised by the busing plan. Beginning in 1991, Biden served as an adjunct professor at the Widener University School of Law, Delaware's only law school, teaching a seminar on constitutional law. The seminar was one of Widener's most popular, often with a waiting list for enrollment. Biden typically co-taught the course with another professor, taking on at least half the course minutes and sometimes flying back from overseas to make one of the classes. During the 2000s, Biden sponsored bankruptcy legislation that was sought by MBNA, one of Delaware's largest companies, and other credit card issuers. He allowed an amendment to the bill to increase the homestead exemption for homeowners declaring bankruptcy and fought for an amendment to forbid anti-abortion felons from using bankruptcy to discharge fines. President Clinton vetoed the bill in 2000, but it finally passed in 2005 as the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act, with Biden support. A vociferous supporter, Biden was one of only 18 Democratic senators to vote with the Republicans in favor of the legislation, while leading Democrats and consumer rights organizations came out in opposition. Biden held up trade agreements with Russia when that country stopped importing U.S. chickens. The downstate Sussex County region is the nation's top chicken-producing area. In 2007, Biden requested and gained $67 million worth of projects for his constituents through congressional earmarks. Reputation Following his first election in 1972, Biden was re-elected to six more Senate terms in 1978, 1984, 1990, 1996, 2002, and 2008, usually getting about 60% of the vote. He did not face strong opposition. Pete DuPont, then governor, chose not to run against him in 1984. Biden spent 28 years as a junior senator due to the two-year seniority of his Republican colleague, William Roth. After Tom Carper defeated Roth in 2000, Biden became Delaware's senior senator. He then became the longest-serving senator in Delaware history and, 
as of 2018, was the 18th longest serving senator in U.S. history. In May 1999, Biden became the youngest senator to cast 10,000 votes. With a net worth between $59,000 and $366,000, and almost no outside income or investment income, Biden was consistently ranked one of the least wealthy members of the Senate. Biden said he was listed as the second poorest member in Congress. He was not proud of the distinction, but attributed it to having been elected early in his career. He has said he realized early in his senatorial career how vulnerable poor public officials are to offers of financial contributions in exchange for policy support and pushed campaign finance reform measures during his first term. The political writer Howard Feynman has said, Biden is not an academic, he's not a theoretical thinker, he's a great street Paul. He comes from a long line of working people, in Scranton auto salesmen, car dealers, people who know how to make a sale. He has that great Irish gift. Political columnist David S. Broder has viewed Biden as having grown since he came to Washington and since his failed 1988 presidential bid. He responds to real people that's been consistent throughout. And his ability to understand himself and deal with other politicians has gotten much, much better. Traub concludes that Biden is the kind of fundamentally happy person who can be as generous toward others as he is to himself. Gaffes During his years as a senator, Biden acquired a reputation for loquaciousness and putting his foot in his mouth. He has been a strong speaker and debater and a frequent and effective guest on Sunday morning talk shows. In public appearances, he is known to deviate from prepared remarks. The New York Times wrote that Biden's weak filters make him capable of blurting out pretty much anything. 2. Thousand Eight Presidential Campaign Biden thought about running for president again ever since his failed 1988 bid. He declared his candidacy for president on January 31, 2007, after having discussed running for months. Biden made a formal announcement to Tim Russert on Meet the Press saying he would be the best Biden I can be. In January 2006, Delaware newspaper columnist Harry F. Thiemel wrote that Biden occupies the sensible center of the Democratic Party. Thiemel concluded that that was the position Biden desired, and that in a campaign he plans to stress the dangers to the security of the average American, not just from the terrorist threat, but from the lack of health assistance crime and energy dependence on unstable parts of the world. During his campaign, Biden focused on the war in Iraq. He touted his record in the Senate as the head of major congressional committees and his experience in foreign policy. Despite speculation to the contrary, Biden rejected the notion of becoming Secretary of State, focusing on only the presidency. At a 2007 campaign event, Biden said, I know a lot of my opponents out there say I'd be a great Secretary of State. Seriously, every one of them, do you watch any of the debates? Joe's right, Joe's right, Joe's right. Other candidates' comments that Joe is right in the Democratic debates were converted into a Biden campaign. In mid 2007, Biden stressed his foreign policy expertise compared to Obama's saying of the latter, I think he can be ready but right now I don't believe he is. The presidency is not something that lends itself to on-the-job training. Biden also said Obama was copying some of his foreign policy ideas. Biden was noted for his one-liners on the campaign trail, saying of Republican then-frontrunner Rudy Giuliani at the debate on October 30, 2007 in Philadelphia, there's only three things he mentions in a sentence, a noun, and a verb and 9 slash 11. Overall, Biden's debate performances were an effective mixture of humor and sharp and surprisingly disciplined comments. A 336 Biden made controversial remarks during the campaign. On the day of his January 2007 announcement, he spoke of fellow Democratic candidate and Senator Barack Obama I mean, you got the first mainstream African-American who is articulate and bright and clean and a nice-looking guy. I mean, that's a storybook, man.
This comment undermined his campaign as soon as it began and significantly damaged his fundraising capabilities. 336. It later took second place on Time magazine's list of top 10 campaign gaffes for 2007. Biden had also been criticized in July 2006 for a remark he made about his support among Indian Americans, I've had a great relationship. Biden later said the remark was not intended to be derogatory. In an unusual move, Biden shared campaign planes with one of his rivals for the nomination, Senator Chris Dodd of Connecticut. Dodd and Biden were friends and seeking to save funds during somewhat long-shot efforts at the nomination. Overall, Biden had difficulty raising funds, struggled to draw people to his rallies, and failed to gain traction against the high-profile candidacies of Obama and Senator Hillary Clinton. He never rose above single digits in national polls of the Democratic candidates. In the first contest on January 3, 2008, Biden placed fifth in the Iowa caucuses, garnering slightly less than 1% of the state delegates. He withdrew from the race that evening, saying, There is nothing sad about tonight. I feel no regret. Despite its lack of success, Biden's stature in the political world rose as the result of his 2008 campaign. A 336 in particular, it changed the relationship between Biden and Obama. Although the two had served together on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, they had not been close, with Biden resenting Obama's quick rise to political stardom and Obama viewing Biden as garrulous and patronizing. 28-337-338, having gotten to know each other during 2007, Obama appreciated Biden's campaigning style and appealed to working-class voters, and Biden said he became convinced Obama was the real deal. 28-337-338, 